Alrighty then. Um, honor to be here amongst you all. And uh, I'll just sort of come clean first by saying that um, uh, this has been a last minute uh, project for me to put together this presentation, something that I'm excited to do. Um, but uh, my own knowledge of OData uh, doesn't go that deep. Um, and yet I still feel like I've got a lot of exciting stuff that I want to share with everybody. So um, thanks for being here. And if there are rough edges, hope, hopefully you'll just uh, bear with that. Um, I'll also say uh, from the get-go, my primary interest in researching OData was because I was particularly had my my interest peaked in the the transactional aspect about it. So it wasn't that long ago that Vince asked for volunteers to do a little bit of of looking into OData, and I asked if I could research that topic. So we're going to cover um, more than just the transactional aspect of OData, but I'll be honest and say that's that's one of the parts that interests me the most, and I'm hoping we can spend some uh some time there because it's, it's some rich rich content what can be done with the transactional aspect um so moving along hopefully on my you're seeing my screen and you can see the sort of overview of topics that i've got for us today i would like to spend maybe about 10 minutes uh maybe it's going to be 15 minutes we'll see um just providing a little bit of background for any beginners who are in the audience and that's because I, I don't want uh, those folks to feel like they were just sort of left in the dust from the get go. If I start using some terminology that um, the experienced and veteran developers, we all take for granted. Um, so that's to say, you know, if you're an advanced developer and you need 10 minutes or so to tune out and go, you know, walk the dog or feed the cat or whatever it is that you might want to do, you can safely do that um, as I covered the topics in part number one there. Um, part number two is where we sort of it's kind of like what I think of as the, the broccoli candy bar design uh, pattern for presentations as you, you know, take care of eating the vegetables and the stuff that you know is good for you, but isn't as alluring as diving into the code. That's the candy bar that you get uh, in areas three and four. So, you know, part number two, we'll be covering just some of the reference material that I imagine we'll all be turning to as we learn more about OData, um, provide that sort of background. And then uh, we'll move on to three and four, which is where I'd like to spend. I'm hoping we can spend about an hour in that area. Uh, we'll see how that works out. Um, looking at the exact uh, sort of some samples of of what can be done, and at that point we'll we'll move away from this sort of slideshow presentation and we'll look at a, a sample file that I've cooked up in FileMaker. Alrighty. So with that said, let's move along. Background for beginners. Um, so FileMaker has a long history of sharing stored data, and that's kind of how OData fits into the picture of things. Um, you know, it's it's not just recently with the data API and with OData that FileMaker's made it possible to share the data stored in your solution. Um, that's been that's been there for as long as I can remember, and basically the way I see it is that with every sort of methodology that we've been given to share data, it was a response to the the technical era that we're in. Um, some of the uh, methodologies that we were given, they've just provided sort of static and manual read only access to the data. And those are, I'm thinking of some of the exports that we had in the earlier versions um, that live with us today. And then as things grew on, we also had some more methodologies added that give dynamic access, um, including updating data that's stored in FileMaker from some sort of system or solution that's outside of FileMaker. So that's how OData is going to fit into this, this picture. It's basically part of uh, a long evolution of FileMaker, making it possible for us to not only store data and manipulate data within FileMaker, but also to share that data elsewhere. Okie doke. So some examples of sharing data with um, from FileMaker Pro over the years. Um, we've got, of course, one that's easy to overlook because we just, you know, sort of take it for granted at this point, exporting records, be it through Excel, comma separated tab values, tab delimited values. Um, we've got JDBC and ODBC. Uh, JDBC is something I played with uh, many years ago. And, um, you know, that probably, you know, that that had to have come around or in, during the time when, when Java was really popular. Um, you know, I don't have an exact timeline for you now, but um, I kind of remember it coming out maybe even in like version four or something. Java was just sort of starting to catch on. 
Um, so FileMaker responded and made that available to us. And I remember being really psyched about it at the time. Um, XML API came along. And again, I see that as a response to the times when XML was sort of like uh, the JSON of yesteryear. We were all excited about using it, gave us a way to exchange uh, information in a sort of standardized fashion. And again, FileMaker was there providing a way for us to uh, get data in, and in this case, both not just out, but both in and out of uh, the FileMaker solution using an XML API. Data API, um, there's probably not much I could say about that that you folks don't already know. It's one of the more recent ways that we can get the data in and out of FileMaker, um, and a really good one at that. I added there uh, down below, not as a joke, FileMaker version 4 Web Companion. You might think that I was just being a little cheeky putting on that in there, but I actually see that as like FileMaker being really sort of ahead of its time. Um, if you can recall that particular interface, it was intended for building web pages, but if you look a little deeper at the details, um, it allowed us to use a GET request or a post, POST request to do things such as update a record, insert a record, delete a record, um, download sets of records, and when you think about that that's what it's doing and you jump forward 20 to 25 years later and realize that's exactly what we're doing now with things like OData, um, you can kind of see why I do think it was sort of ahead of its time and I give a lot of kudos to the, the people who made that possible to us um, way back then in, in version four. So that's uh, you know your basic tour of some of the ways you can share data with FileMaker over the years. And as I said, OData is just sort of it's it's the next uh, it's the next and most contemporary um, feature that we're getting in in this uh, area. Uh, and that's what this slide is about. Um, continues the tradition of sharing the data, gives us access to the data, um, also allows us to modify the data. Something that is really I think important in these times is based on a well-known standard, um, so it's not something proprietary. And on on the other hand, actually, it's it's something that you could hand off to a developer who maybe knows very little about FileMaker, and they can still hit the ground running um, because it's something that's uh, bigger than FileMaker, um, the OData specification that is. One of the um, features that I find particularly alluring for OData is the fact that it requires minimal adaptation of your solution to use. Um, those of us who have used things like the XML API or the data API, um, we remember going through that learning phase where suddenly something's not working with your integration, and then somebody says to you, did you change anything on the layout? Did you add a field, remove a field, or something like that? And you, you just have that aha moment. You realize that you had some layouts that should have been considered sacrosanct and never touched and so forth which is all fine, um, but what I really love, or one of the things that I really love about OData is that it doesn't require that. Um, it allows us to hook into our solutions without, um, without having to have protected layouts with certain fields or certain portals. Um, and again, not, not to knock any of that, I've been grateful for every piece of it, but I'm really excited to have some liberation from that as well. Um, the last thing that I'll say is I'm going to give some kudos to the people who documented the OData. And by this documentation, I'm talking about the documentation on the Claris site. Um, I probably visited that date, that documentation for the first time about a week or two ago. And it's very well done. It's comprehensive. It's localized in various languages. It has examples for just about everything. And pretty much with about 90% of the examples, I was able to um, just get going and have something work on the first time. So a lot of credit to the people who put that together. I think if you turn to it to learn about OData, you'll find um, you'll find that it's it's a uh, it's easy to work with. And um, there there are a few points where where it did get a little did get a little sticky for me. Um, attention to detail is your friend at that point. Doing a little external research is your friend as well. Um, but hopefully I'll be able to share some of the some of the places where it gets a little bit. Uh, a little hairier in putting together the requests and um, get folks beyond that as well. Um, so let's see, moving on, use cases for OData. I put this in because Vince asked me to talk about this and I'll, I'll be honest, um, I'm probably not a good choice of somebody to sort of 
evangelize all of the possibilities that OData can be used for. Um, I'm kind of more of a geeky person who's interested in the intricacies of how you perform the calls and so forth. So um, forgive me for punting a little bit on this one. Basically say, um, you know, a very obvious use case uh, is having some sort of web website that needs to integrate with your FileMaker data. Um, but really anything that's that requires access to data stored in FileMaker Pro, whether it's something that needs to push in a periodic update or something that needs to read data and publish it somewhere else, um, OData is, is uh, definitely a contender for something that can work for you there. Um, all righty. So I'm going to move on a little bit just to talk a, a little bit of background about something called HTTP. And again, this is this is for the beginners. Um, and I'm doing this because I want to avoid that sort of situation where I start throwing around terminology throughout the rest of the presentation without um, taking into consideration that maybe it's not familiar to everybody. So, uh, you know, for the advanced people, just hang in there with me a few more minutes. Uh, we're going to talk about HTTP. Um, what is HTTP? It is a protocol. Um, you can think of that as like a set of rules that define interactions between a client and a server. Um, it's basically uh, you can you can think of it in terms of defining how a request is sent to a server, and that means what content is is included in that request and how it's packaged up and how it's formatted and structured, and how the server is going to interpret that and the structure of the message that the server is going to respond with. Um, it's absolutely foundational to the internet. Um, if you're using a web browser during the day, you are guaranteed to be uh, doing things that are using the HTTP protocol. Um, I would say more than 19 times out of 20, you're doing something HTTP was underneath there, um, providing some, some data exchange between your browser and a server. Um, so let's talk just a little bit more about HTTP. You know it's a protocol um, for having an exchange between a client and a server, and by a client, that could be a web browser, that could be uh, your FileMaker Pro solution. Um, it could be it could be just about any code that needs to talk to a server. Um, so, four basic components to HTTP requests and responses. And by request, I mean when a client asks for something of a server, and by response, I mean when the server responds to that request for whatever that something was. The four basic components that I'd like to call out. One is a verb. Uh, back in the day, we used to call it a method. Um, but we've got some, let's see, one, two, three, four, five common verbs. I'm not sure if that's all of them, to be honest with you. I'm not an HTTP spec expert. Um, those are the ones that we're going to be seeing and working with the most, though, in this presentation. You've got get and post, which were the ones that um, they've been sort of the workhorses for a lot of code that's that's gone down through the ages to render your web pages. Um, the three others, put, patch, and delete. Um, also equal parts of the you know possible verbs in the HTTP spec. They didn't used to be as common, um, but uh, they're they're used in in O data, and that's that's why I've got them on here, and also for the sake of completion. Um, a verb is basically describes the type of action that's going to be happening. So even though the names don't make sense, figure that each of these different names, be it get, post, put, patch, delete can be associated with some sort of action that we're, we're going to be performing when we use OData. Um, the next component that everybody's probably familiar with is a URL. You can think of that as, well, it's, it's the same as the URL that you put in your URL bar of a browser when you're um, sending your browser off to go connect to some website. Um, basically think of it as an address or a locator to some sort of resource that you're asking to access. Headers. Headers are part of the, the request and response message. And I think of them sort of like a customs declaration, if you will. You know, if you're getting on an airplane, traveling somewhere, you arrive and basically you're filling in some form or somebody's asking you, hey, where are you headed? That would be your URL. What are you intending to do there? That might be in, that might be mentioned in the verb or might be mentioned in the URL. The headers might also have a little bit to say about what you're intending to do at, uh, at, when you arrive at your destination. Um, those customs people will probably ask you things like, what are you bringing with you? How much is it worth? How much of it is there? Uh, give us a description of it. Those things are all encoded in headers as well. The headers talk about what sort of payload, what sort of message payload, and that'll be the last component we mentioned here. 
is being sent. It'll talk about uh, how much of that payload, what the nature of it is, and um, a lot of other preferences or, or aspects of the message not worth getting into here. Um, the takeaway is basically these are the four components that you might hear us talking about when we banter about HTTP. You'll oftentimes hear people say things like, oh, you just need to do a post request for that, or yeah, it's as simple as a get request, or just make an HTTP connection to that URL and make sure you get the headers right. Oh, I didn't get the headers right. Anytime you hear that terminology, it's just about these items here, these, these four items from HTTP. No reason to think that it's something big, scary, or complex. Um, it's just the nomenclature that, that goes with the territory. Um, as a last example of this, I've got a screenshot from an excellent uh, application called Postman that facilitates uh, working with HTTP connections. Um, for those of you who are going to be diving into OData, if you don't already use Postman or something similar, I suggest strongly uh, that you do. Um, it'll take care of a lot of the sort of uh, details that are easy to make mistakes with, and having that out of your way will make it easier to actually work on the the, the sort of message exchange that you're focusing upon. Um, so this is just an illustration here. You can see this is a, a breakdown of an HTTP request. These lines here that say header. Uh, two through two through six. That's an example of some header content. It's talking about what's being sent, who's sending it, uh, what you're expecting to get back. Um, up at the top, you can see post. The HTTP verb is included, and the URL, the destination, is also included there. In this case, it's an example of an OData request asking to perform a script. Uh, down at the very bottom, you see an example of the payload. Um, so, having said that, the recap. Uh, OData, it's a standard for sharing data. The use case is anytime there's a need to get data in or out of FileMaker Pro and HTTP, it's a, a, a protocol, a specification that very clearly defines um, what the message interaction is supposed to be between a client and a server. So henceforth in this discussion, um, the server that we're talking about will be an OData enabled FileMaker server be it FileMaker in the cloud or FileMaker uh, on-premise on Linux. Uh, and the client will be, it could be any sort of code that needs to connect to uh, that server. So don't, don't get the idea that it's, we're going to limit it to just a, uh, a FileMaker solution, uh, just because later on I'll be using FileMaker to make the connections and illustrate some things. Um, the, the code that's connecting to the server could be a web page that you've written in any of the languages or frameworks that are available. Um, it could be some other solution. Um, we'll leave it at that. All right. Thanks, everybody, uh, especially if you're an advanced person and none of that was new. I appreciate you letting me uh, take a moment to cover that. We're going to talk about OData, sort of the basics of what you need to get set up and, and use it. Okay, first off, uh, I mentioned already that I'm delighted with the with the documentation that Claris has provided for OData. So I've got the URL. You're definitely going to want to bookmark. Um, I mentioned before also it's localized, uh, which I think is fantastic. I didn't even realize that. And just yesterday I said, well, let me take a look and see if this is in other languages. And bam, it was in about every language that I could possibly think of to put a, uh, a language code in there for. And um, well, let's just say I was very pleased and impressed with that. Down below it, you'll see the longer URL is to it's a it's to a site that will give you the nitty gritty and big time details of uh, the OData specification. Um, it is rather technical, so um, I would say go there if you're somebody who's comfortable with uh, digesting technical specifications. You will find answers that uh, will fill in some of the, the blanks that, that you might um, still need to have answered after you've looked at the Claris documentation. For the most part, I didn't need to have to go there, but I was interested in um, sort of pursuing some little details. And uh, for that, I spent some time looking at the docs there. Um, the last URL, of course, is uh, the company that I work for. Um, this is not so much to promote them, but just uh, to promote the fact that we do intend to um, come out with some information on OData to share with everybody. And 
I think it very likely that, you know, much of the content that you're seeing here in this presentation will wind up in some way, shape or form uh, available through us. So keep an eye out for what we've got. Okay, so supported environments at present at the time of this presentation, we've got 2 environments that support OData with FileMaker. Uh, 1 is Claris FileMaker cloud. Uh, I've got a link to some documentation there. I can't speak much to it because um, I'm not a savvy FileMaker cloud user. So I'll sort of just leave that bullet point there for us for the sake of documentation and, and we'll try to elaborate on it. Um, same really goes for FileMaker Server on Linux. That's that's where I'm getting my experience in working with OData is uh, with a an on-premise or rather with a, a Linux-based FileMaker server installation. Um, you've got a link to the documentation there. Again, I'm I'm not going to try to dive into those because I'm really not the sort of person that can bring you uh, shed expert light onto those things. Um, so this is just to sort of leave them for everybody to see and um, know that those are the two currently supported environments. Okay, uh, getting started with OData and the FileMaker server admin console. This, of course, assumes that you're familiar with uh, running a FileMaker server installation. If so, you're, I'm certain, familiar with this particular screen. Um, just wanted to show you there's an option down here under connectors for OData, and that's how you're able to enable the OData feature or disable it. Uh, another uh, aspect of the admin console, logging. Um, under the logs tab or under the logs section, you've got the ability to download uh, an access log for OData. Um, I'll be honest and say that I'm not sure if there are multiple formats of that log or whether uh, there's just a single format. I downloaded um, the log from our own server and it looked something like this. Um, for those of you familiar with a basic HTTP access log, it's not going to come as any surprise. Um, the reason that I wanted to show this is to illustrate that it's not logging the actual payload content. It's logging the URLs and um, not much more than that, actually. You know, the, the of course, the error codes and so forth. Um, but that's important to know that, you know, sort of what information is winding up in your log files. Is there sensitive data that's winding up in there or not? And a moment ago, I mentioned that I'm not sure if there are different flavors of the log file. I wouldn't be surprised if there's some sort of hidden feature that I don't know about to change uh, the content of the log file. I simply don't know. Um, by default, this is what we're getting, and it's not including the payload content. It is, however, including the URL information. So we'll leave that. All righty, moving forward. Um, in your FileMaker file, not surprisingly, there is an extended privilege set called FMO data. And also, as you would expect, you enable that for those accounts that you want to have um, the ability to access O data. And um, not much more to say about this. It, it works as you would expect. You know, if you've got this uh, particular extended privilege enabled for an account, that account is able to access O data. And if you don't, um, you get an error message on an attempt to connect. Um, the Best practice recommendation is also not going to be surprising. It's it's of course to sort of limit access uh, to the sort of uh, minimum necessary. Um, so you can see in this particular setup, I devoted a single account to have access to FMO data, and in this case, I gave very little other privileges to this particular account. Um, yeah, we'll leave that at that. Uh, on the topic of authentication, this is another topic where I'm going to punt a little bit because, again, I don't have expert um, ability to speak to the Claris ID uh, framework and so forth. I know there are plenty of experts out there, so I'm going to sort of encourage all of us uh, who don't know to learn more about it. Those of you who do already know, um, nothing to explain to you. The Claris ID is the authentication method methodology for uh, using OData with the cloud installation. With FileMaker Server on Linux, uh, we're not using the Claris ID. Instead, we're using a basic account and uh, password credentials. You can see down here, um, there's the note about FileMaker Linux and how it uses that. So that's, that's actually what I've been using. It is an interesting point um, because 
uh, somewhere along the line, you have to figure out where in your code you're going to store these sorts of things. And again, I'm going to punt a little bit on that too, because while I have a lot of other uh, information that I'd like to share, there's no way that I could come across as a security expert. So let's leave it at that. I'll point out the fact that there is, you know, a security concern about where you're going to store your credentials um, when you're accessing uh, OData, as as would be the case with, you know, credentials for any system that you're accessing, um, be it in a FileMaker context or elsewhere. Alrighty, so as a recap, um, we took a look at some documentation links. Um, FileMaker Cloud and FileMaker Server Linux are the two currently supported environments for OData. Um, we saw some screenshots of the admin console that show how OData is controlled, enabled, or disabled, and how you can access the log file. Um, we talked about the extended privilege set that has to be set to use OData, and uh, just some cursory mention of Claris ID and account password um, authentication. So um, at this point, I would kind of like to, oh, I see we do have a question here. Does this mean OData isn't usable for Mac OS or Windows? Um, yeah, if we're talking about a FileMaker on-premise installation on Mac OS or Windows at present, uh, OData is not available. I am hoping um, that that could change, but it's really not my position to, to speak on that other than to say that I do hope that that we see it on other platforms as well. Um, honestly, I'll, I'll just get my other hope out of the way. Uh, my hope is that someday we get um, a script step that's equivalent to the execute data API script step called something like execute OData script step. Uh, that would uh, that would put me in heaven. I think that would be really cool. Um, I would like to pause for a moment to take any questions. And I'm also just scanning the chat list to see if anybody else posted other questions. What would you, would you say that OData is an extension of the earlier FileMaker API? What does it add to the party? Tony, man, you must be working on my side, right? Because you're, you're like on to, to talk about um, something that also, I love here. We have, we have a couple new arrivals. If you could mute your, your sessions. Um, Andrew, Jeff. Okay, is OData an extension of the earlier FileMaker API, meaning like the data API, Tony, separate and? Uh, uh, yes, uh, the FileMaker data API. It looks remarkably similar, but I'm sure that there's some awesome new benefits to this. Yeah, well, for me, the awesome benefit is not having to use uh, layouts and uh, relationships to get at your data. You can think of sort of how groundbreaking it was in FileMaker 12 when SQL came made was available to us with the execute SQL script step. And we all kind of went bonkers with this idea of, of no longer being tied to the context and um, a lot of excitement about that. And of course, as time goes on, you know, wisdom is gained and, and our enthusiasm is tempered a little bit. And we learn there are cases where you would use it, where you wouldn't use it, but it does harken back to that um, where suddenly there's this liberating moment where you don't have to uh, think in terms of layouts or maintain special layouts. It's kind of like um, a beautiful combination of of the freedom of SQL and the convenience of JSON, and um, it's, it's sort of packaged up very conveniently. You know, once you get used to um, concocting the the HTTP requests, it's it's a lot of fun to to access the data. So Does that's that very cool. No, no layouts alone. If that's a big thing. No layouts. Indeed, indeed. Um, that's that's as somebody who's not out there um, building websites, accessing FileMaker. I'm I'm sort of approaching this from my own FileMaker geek world, and um, that's the part that really thrills me a lot. Um, and we're going to see that. We're going to we're going to move on and take a look at it. Um, any other questions before I I move us forward? Okay. Wait a second more. Let's do it then. Um, before we move forward, I've got this one screen up here. I hope people don't feel it's corny. Uh, there's a lot of gratitude I feel for the people that you see up on the screen here. Mentioned by first name because I'm not sure you know who's okay with their name being mentioned and I didn't have time to ask for permission. Um, but these are these are all people who in one way or another helped make this presentation possible, um, providing help to me uh, to make 
to sort of help me organize my thoughts, organize the presentation, put it into something that looks better than I could do on my own, um, or just doing other work uh, at Beeswax that's inspired me because they're, you know, they've sort of digging into some territory that that stimulates my own interest in the transactional uh, part of OData. So um, we'll move forward. I just wanted to take a moment to sort of call out and say thanks to all the people that you're seeing up on the screen there. Okay, we're now at the candy bar um, and we're at about the point where I'd, I was hoping, right at the hour. Um, the candy bar being what I consider the fun part and you get to sort of geek out hands-on with a file. So um, let's get rid of the slides for now. And uh, we'll take a look at a sample file that I have in FileMaker. This is being hosted on a FileMaker Linux installation. So of course it's it's got the OData happening. It's been enabled and I've got the, uh, you know, the extended privilege set uh, set so that I can access it. Um, you know, some basic test data, something, something that I often do just, you know, set of names and uh, a little bit of other data so we can, you know, see what it's like to pull stuff from this and, and whatnot. First thing that I want to show you about this file though, so let's take a look at the relationship graph. Nothing there. Um, we've got two tables and uh, no relationships to speak of. Um, the two tables are just, you know, real basic data stuff. The um, layouts, the next thing I wanted to show you. Again, nothing really to speak of layouts. We're looking at one of them right now. It's the basic form view uh, with a few fields on it showing this table. Um, the other one, I don't even know what's on it, but that's kind of the joy of it all is that these layouts, um, they don't have to be there. They don't have to have certain fields on there. Um, really, all that has to happen in order to be able to access this is to have some sort of table occurrence that we can reference in the same way that uh, when we use execute SQL, we reference some um, things by table occurrence. And that's an interesting thing that I'll note. I was actually expecting that we would do references by table names, but as you see um, the examples that we're going through, um, as you see the examples that we're going through, the references that look like tables, they're actually references to table occurrence names. Uh, and I just saw a comment there, reminiscent of ODBC, not constrained by layout, layout context. Michael, I agree entirely. Um, uh, or JDBC. And, and in fact, you know, back in, in JDBC, I, I'm, uh, I was going to say pretty sure, but I'm actually perfectly sure that we have transactional uh, capabilities too. So I've been kind of waiting for this time where we get transactional capability that's uh, sort of unbound by layouts and so, so on and so forth. And I waited long enough and we've got it. So let's take a look at some of the, some of the things we can do with this. I'm going to sort of place the data window a little bit behind so we can still kind of see it as we work through some examples. Um, those of you who are familiar with Postman, a tool that I mentioned earlier on, this FileMaker file is just sort of like a, a very dumbed down version of Postman um, that's sort of uh, tailored to this presentation so that I could run through a lot of examples for us. Um, you'll see the URL that we're connecting to up at the top. You'll see all of the curl options that we're using and the script that makes this connection will be used insert from, uh, insert from URL. Uh, with the standard curl options and whatnot, these will be the options that will be used. Um, down below, HTTP request. The query is for any payload that we're sending to the server. Um, those of you familiar with HTTP will know that for the GET requests, we aren't sending any payload, but for other requests such as POST and PUT and PATCH, um, we will probably be including some payload, and that will go down in this field that you see in the lower portion of the screen. Um, we'll be able to see the HTTP response that comes back. A uh, couple more details about it. I've sort of uh, engineered things a little bit to obscure host names and authorization headers. So when you see something like this in brackets, uh, you can know that that's just me sort of doctoring up the UI a little bit, and these would be replaced with real data um, at the time when you're actually using this. So um, let's take a look at the first example. It's a GET request, which means we come up with just a URL that specifies what we want to do. Um, a lot of this URL is going to be repeated in many of these examples, so we'll get used to it. The host of the OData installation 
some required portions that should probably make sense or at least look familiar if you've used other uh, FileMaker APIs. Um, this segment here, second from the end, is the file name. You can see I've got the file name there, and that's where it appears in the URL. Uh, the last portion of this particular URL is the table. That's the, actually, I should say table occurrence. That's the table occurrence name that we'll be drawing data from. And this particular command, let's run it, should select all of the record data and it's returned in JSON. So um, you can see it, it comes in sort of a, an enveloping object um, where the value uh, property in, includes an array of all of the data that we're selecting out of the sample table. No big surprises here. Um, in fact, it, it looks very much very similar to an SQL call just in, in JSON format. Um, the last little detail that I'll give you about this particular demo file so that it makes sense as we move forward is I've got this tidied response raw response feature. The actual response that we're getting back from the server looks more like this when I put it at raw response. It's got some additional links um, that at, at present, I'm not particularly interested in using or seeing, and that's why I made a tidied response to sort of provide something that was easier for my eyes to take a look at and scan through and see what's there. Otherwise, it's the same data. Um, so when if you see me to tidied response is just something that sort of strips out some of the stuff that um, doesn't necessarily advance our understanding of this at this time. Um, if I'm moving through these examples and somebody really wants to see the raw response, just uh, pipe up for a moment and we can certainly toggle back and forth. Okay, so without any context uh, or without any special layout, we've been able to, I shouldn't say without context, without any special layout, we've been able to select all records from this table. Um, we can also select, we can target a particular record. And in this case, um, I'll, I'll stop for a moment here and to say, uh, when you see the, the tilde slash notation, that's just shorthand in this case for everything that comes before the last portion of the URL. Um, that's something that Mark Scott helped me come up with uh, mm -hmm. just yesterday when I was struggling with needing a whole lot of screen real estate. He said to me, hey, Steve, do they really need to see all of that every single time? And um, so the suggestion came up to, to shorten it so that we could just kind of focus on what we need to. Um, okay, moving on from that explanation. We're still looking into the person table and we are providing the idea of a record that we wanna pull information from. Um, the headers are still basically very simple. We've got authorization and just some, some things that you'd expect to see, um, you know, telling them that we're expecting JSON, uh, the versions of OData that we expect to be using. All of this, by the way, can be found um, in the documentation. And I'm not sure whether I did it for this one. I plan on having this file shared at some point. Um, and I tried to put links to specific areas uh, in the documentation. So, oh, it looks like I'm set for Spanish. How about that? Let's uh, let's try this again. So that if you're working through this file, you can click on something and it'll take you to the relevant section of the documentation. You can read up on it and that can sort of supplement your understanding of what's going on in this particular example. So um, I'm doing my best to make these URLs be specific to the example record that you're sitting in. Um, I'm talking a lot and not sending many uh, requests. So let's go ahead and send this off. We're getting our data back from one particular record. It's the record that matches this ID. Ignacio is down here. You can see his, he's got the ID that begins in 81. And that is in fact what we pulled out here. Got all of his data. Um, it's interesting to note, you know, you think about this for a minute, how on earth does does OData even know which field is considered our primary key field? We've given it a primary key. It understands that we want this particular record. And the answer is that the OData system is looking through the schema of the table and, and looking for a field that's got the typical characteristics. It's been set for unique. It's been set for non-null. Um, I did monkey around a little bit to see what would happen if you had multiple fields that way. And it does seem to prefer one. I think it's the you know, the one origin, you know, created sooner. Um, don't quote on that for sure though. Uh, but basically, you know, it's, it's worth knowing that there's a little bit of, of sort of intuition that's going on behind the scenes to figure out which is your primary key. Um, alternatively, there's a methodology or there's a method whereby you can specify 
a record using a row ID value instead of um, a primary key value. And by that, I mean the internal row ID that FileMaker associates with each record. And um, I haven't played with that yet, so I can't offer you a whole lot of feedback with it, but I, I did want you to be aware that that's another option for doing this sort of thing um, when you're targeting a particular record. And of course, targeting a particular record happens not just when you're selecting data, but also when you're doing things like updating or deleting uh, data. Okay, moving forward, and uh, row ID equals record ID. Yes, thanks, Tony. Um, it's kind of interesting. They refer to it as row ID in, in O data. And yeah, somebody said close for localization. I, I couldn't agree more. I was so impressed when I saw that. Um, give me a second to read this other question. So it doesn't use record ID. Target an individual record. Okay, so Tony was clarifying that. Um, just to jump back for a second, to target an individual record can happen by primary key or can happen by row ID more to the primary ID case uh, at this point, because that's that's what I've been working to develop these examples. Um, okay, the next sort of uh, record selection that I'd like to cover is one where you can perform matching on a field or many fields. Um, you're allowed to use uh, logical operators, so it's not that you're just um, selecting criteria against one field. You can use ands and ors and group things with parentheses and so forth. Um, this is a simple example of searching, and you can see down here, I've got this little string here that I just highlighted that says last name EQ year, which is to say, find me um, the records where the last name field is equal to dear, D-E-E-R. This is case sensitive. And again, just for one moment to jump back in time, those folks who remember FileMaker 4, that web, uh, web companion API, it was using these same operators, so I won't um, beat that that dead horse anymore. But I will say again, I, I think that the people who came up that that they were um, they were ahead of their time. Um, so here we are using the same operators, the EQ operator. Um, let's go ahead and run this, and we've got one record apparently uh, that matches Daryush Deer. We could change this around. Let's just. Um, Let's find somebody else. I see we've got a Joe Jaguar. And that's what we should get if we run it. There's Joe. Um, I don't think we need to do more examples. Um, basically, what you're looking at, though, uh, to sort of put some terminology in it, is we're using what's called a filter query option. So you can see the filter, it starts with this um, this string here that's dollar sign filter equals. That's the start of a of a filter option. And then after that, you get the information that specifies the, the matching criteria that you plan to use. There are a lot of uh, possibilities for matching. I think there'll be a couple more examples in this file, um, but definitely something that you'll want to explore. And, you know, there are things like starts with, um, we'll, we'll, we'll see some of the examples. I, I won't try to list them without having them in front of me. Okay, selecting a count of records. Um, that's as simple as using the count query option at the end of the URL here. So this is uh, basically a rehashing of the query that we did to select all records in a table. By adding the count uh, query operator, we get a count of those of that found set instead of the actual data. Um, let's see it. There we go. 32 records, 32 records in the table. Later on, we'll see that if we were doing something like a matching situation, um, we could also apply the count operator and um, we'd be able to see the count of matching records. Um, so it's not just for when you're, it's not just for when you're selecting all records in a table. It's, um, you know, it's more powerful than that. Next example we've got here is a query operator. All of these things are called query operators and um, they're all in the documentation. Um, query operator called select. And I should, I should mention too, these these query operators, because we're dealing with the OData specification, these are not proprietary FileMaker Claris uh, operators that we're looking at here. This is uh, this is standardized and something that you can carry elsewhere. And those people who have used this technology elsewhere will be able to bring to your FileMaker situation. So um, that's another really nice thing about it is is the the fact that it's I won't say it's universal, but it's it's uh, reaches a much wider audience and uh, worth learning. 
So this query operator is called select, and what it does is it specifies which fields to return in the result set. So rather than receiving all fields, we can send a request and have it be pared down to just see first name and ID because that's what we asked for. We could include last name if we wanted to, and we'd get something like that. Okay. Why would it if Sorry, I'm going to look at the questions for a second here. My question is, would there be a use case for transmogrifying a request from FileMaker user to OData query? You know what? I'm not going to try to touch that right now, Mike, or Scott, rather. Um, let's see Let's see if we can hang on to that question for a little bit later. Um, and I say that just because I don't think I can uh, concisely address it and keep the flow going at this point. But I, I think it's a worthwhile question, so I hope we can get to it. Sort the result set. Okay, another query operator, not surprisingly called order by, again, hearkening to SQL. Um, this particular example, I've got it listed here in the notes, order by first name descending. So again, for anybody familiar with SQL, there's nothing surprising here. Um, we send the request, everything's been ordered in this case uh, by first name descending. So that's why we've got Quinn and Preston at the top, moving all the way down, we get to the M's and so forth. Um, again, all this stuff is in the documentation. Instead of using DESC, I think the abbreviation for ascending is just ASC. We could have it be ascending. Your choice of what field name you want to have in here. In fact, let's just uh, vary it up for a second. We'll put in favorite numbers since I see we have that here. Favorite number ascending. Let's give it a go, see what happens. Okay, not surprisingly, zeros at the top, so on and so forth. Let's keep going because I don't think that's a particularly uh, difficult uh, example that needs belaboring. Um, this next example, is combining different query options, you're not limited to just using one query option. Um, you can combine them and in typical URL fashion, they're being separated by the ampersand character. So this is an example where we've got a couple of uh, query options being used. Uh, we're ordering or we're sorting the, the found set by first name, and we're also specifying that just the first name and the ID fields should be included. So let's run that, and it behaves. Is that behaving as expected? It is, because this is descending sort. So we've got just the fields that we asked for. We've got the order that we asked them for in, and the bigger lesson to be learned here is that it's possible to combine multiple query options into a single query. Limiting the result set. Again, similar to SQL, we've got the ability to specify that we only want to receive a maximum number of rows in our response set. Um, so, whereas in SQL, you'd be using something like fetch first n rows only, um, we've got a query option that's called top. Top in this case uh, is set to three, which means we want uh, no more than three records. We want three records in our result set, unless, of course, we're at the end of the results. And maybe there's going to be fewer than three. Um, this is also another example of combining queries. Let's see it happen. Okay, so we got our maximum of three records. Uh, they've been ordered in a particular order, and we've sp specified which particular fields are going to be included. Um, the next question that this sort of raises is what if you want to offset the result so that you can basically do your batching? And that's what the skip query operator allows you to do. Um, the language should make it pretty intuitive. You're going to skip a certain number of records specified by the skip uh, query option. So let's see, in this example, we are sorting with the order by. We're sorting first name ascending. We're specifying with the select query operator that we are going to just return those same two fields we've been using over and over again, ID and first name. We're specifying that we want the result set to contain three records and we want to offset by 12 records. Um, again, not much of a surprise. Uh, let's see, what do we sort by first name ascending? Let's try that here and just kind of confirm that it, it looks like we got what we expected. And we're going to offset by 12, so let's go to record 13. We're at Darius, Dogfish, Darius, Dory, and Evelio. And that's what we've got here. So um, not that we were expecting it to fail, but kind of... Uh, Nice to confirm that it did work. 
combining query options for a targeted result. What on earth is this one about? Let's see here. Um, I'm just going to read it up here. I honestly don't remember what I was getting at here. Order by. So we're going to be sorting the results uh, by birthday in this case. Birthday ascending. Uh, I know what this is about. We're just requesting one record. The point of this is strategically combining some query options to get something that we want in a very targeted way. In this way, I want a query to find out who's the oldest person in this set. So I've concocted a query that says, let's order everybody by birthday uh, ascending, which means the, the birthday farthest into the past will be at the top of the set. And let's just get that first record and let's select the first name and last name and the birthday. So if we do this, we see, looks like Hermione Horse is uh, the oldest person in this set. Let's take a look. Oh, okay. It is indeed true for a minute. That looked wrong to me. Filter operation on a date field. Okay, the reason why I put this example in here um, is to show that again with the with the filter query option, it comes with some some functions that you can use. So this is an example of using a date function on a date field so that we can do some intelligent querying, which we're not just limited to saying starts with, ends with, greater than, less than. You can see that we've got a function that'll take date input and return. Uh, the month in this case of the date, and then we can use it with the equals operator to compare to a value. When it's unescaped, that filter query looks like this. Filter equals month of the birthday equal to six. So basically when we run this query, we're asking for all of the people in our table whose uh, birthday happens in June. Uh, I'm gonna take a look at questions for a minute. Data limits. Listen. Why do data limits exist? Is everything going to Claris for processing for some reason? Scott, would you like to pipe up for a second and, and, and explain a little bit? Which, which question, Steve? <laughs> Why do data limits exist? Is everything going to Claris for processing for some reason? Yeah. I mean, Right, so I get a data limit with my license. I don't personally, but I want to know for the general public what the hell's going on. Where is my see. data going? Why am I being charged when I go over a certain value? Why is even anybody even measuring that? Scott, and I'm going to beg your yeah. pardon, but I'd like to keep that question towards later. I I was thinking when when I saw okay. the word data limits, I thought we were talking about offset and 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 that sort of limit. So I thought there was something maybe I could clarify about yeah. that really quickly. Okay. Um, yeah. definitely a worthwhile question. I'm definitely not the person who could address it the best. Um, so I hope you'll forgive me in in moving us no, forward. No, no, no. I'm sure the other Steve can. Okay, <laughs> probably. So that's why we've got two of us. You know, it's always good to have a couple extra around. And believe me, that happens. All right, so moving to the next example here, we've got filter matching. Um, I just wanted to point out that it's case sensitive, again, hearkening to SQL. So in this case, I've got a filter set up that says last name equal bear, but I put bear in all caps um, just to prove that we're not going to get uh, whoever it is here that's got bear as a last name. Bethina bear is not going to show up in this result because this is case sensitive. And you can see there, there's the empty result set. Um, next example shows that you get around it in a similar way that you would do with SQL. We've got a two upper uh, function that we can apply to a string value, and that will allow us to, uh, to use that function against our field value and compare it to an uppercase bear string. And in this case, we will have Bethina returned as a result. There it is. And, um, you know, not surprisingly, there's there's an equivalent function for lower. I, it's probably called to lower, but off the top of my head, I'm not 100% sure about that. Um, so that's just to call it the case sensitivity, sort of show it, uh, illustrate one more time that we're dealing with something that's very similar to SQL. So to uh, sort of highlight the fact that these functions exist and, you know, if you get into this, it's worth uh, learning about the functions that exist. I think this is one of the cases where you might have to go to the more technical documentation that's not on the Clara site to see the full list of um, 
available functions, but definitely worth a, a look. Let's see another match function example. Ah, okay, this is again just to show off more functions. In this case, we're using a length function on the first name value. Um, and I think after this, I don't belabor it with any more examples. By this point, you've got the idea that there's sort of a library of functions out there that we can use for this sort of thing. So this should be finding people whose first name uh, has fewer than five characters. Let's see what we get. We get Joe and we get Maya. And uh, I'm not going to bother with the exercise of, of verifying that it's the case. I'm willing to believe it. Uh, hopefully you are too. Um, this stuff is working pretty well as far as I can see. So we're moving on. Um, okay, sorry, I was just following the, the conversation about the, the metering of data again. I'm, as I said, I'm gonna leave that for now. Um, we're kind Scott, of can, I, can I ask a question? Um, yeah. I, I've got the, and I, I dropped it in the chat, but I, I, I think it kind of slipped uh, beneath the water. Uh, I, I have the FileMaker 18 data API Docs up side by side with the OData. It seems that the more modern OData gives you the ability to patch a record using the primary key versus the record ID. That seems really, uh, and I think you mentioned it earlier, but I, I, it seems really significant. If yeah, I'm well, reading that right. Well, I is you know significant. It's a matter of opinion. To me, it is significant. Um, it's definitely. You know, I'm not going to say no to that feature. If I if I can do it both ways, um, certainly I'm I'm delighted. Um, you know, you I'm I'm sure you might have your own reasons for why it's even more significant to you. We'll just we we, we did we did one project where there was a little bit of a it, it felt like there was a little bit of a a, a little bit of a too much back and forth. Uh, you know, you push a record from a file maker go mm -hmm. to the mothership, so to speak, and you don't know the record ID that's going to be handed out at that point in time. But if you're using a UUID primary key and push that, you, you're you're done in one trip versus two. Uh, yeah. So good job, whoever implemented that. Yeah, uh, well, uh, agreed. Or I, I will say even generally, like, good good job on the whole implementation. There's, there's a lot that I'm excited about. And really, you know, there, there are a couple of questions I have about things that we may or may not be able to do with this, but but no sore points with this. Um, uh, or at least I should say no, no sort of points with what I've seen with the functionality that's that's available. It's pretty cool stuff. So I'm with you there, Tony. Yep. Um, and thanks for that comment. So we're moving along here. Let's see, we got about a half hour left. We're not doing too bad. Um, and we're about halfway through these. We're, we're okay. Um, we're going to start seeing some of the examples in this file here of uh, working with metadata. I didn't do a lot here with this, um, so I just sort of documented a few examples of of the URLs that are in the docs with actual, you know, examples in this file. Um, let's see what this one claims to do. Return the target solution. Um, that's not surprising because the second to the last uh, segment of the URL is in fact the file name, and then we have the metadata option right here. So let's just see what we get. Um, and in fact, let's see this one in its full raw form. Um, it's looking like we're getting table definitions. And that's no big surprise. Uh, you're getting a preview right now of what a, you know, if you haven't seen the docs for it yet, you get an idea of like what the what the table definitions look like in, in this particular, um, uh, how shall I say it, in this particular format. Um, and again, you know, for for the veterans and experts, there's, there's no big surprise here. We're, we're seeing definitions of the fields, the field types and so forth. Um, let's jump forward through a few more of these because there's some even more exciting stuff to get to later on here. Um, selecting server level metadata. Let's just run it and see what we get. Uh, in this case, it looks like I'm getting uh, information about all of the OData enabled files on this server. And I can see that there's a, there's a file in here that I sort of started one day and I named it the wrong thing. I was thinking ODBC, I named it ODBC. Uh, I should have named it OData. So this was kind of a dead end, um, but apparently it's still on the server and still enabled. So that's why it's showing up in this particular output. Um, looks like somebody else has got an OData test on that server as well. So this is metadata at the server level. Selecting a table definition. I suspect this is gonna be similar to what we just saw a minute ago. Um, and it is awfully similar. We're looking at, um, again, we're looking at a table definition in this case, 
Um, that's very interesting. You know what? I'm not. I'm gonna I'm not gonna try to speak intelligently about this because what's what's interesting to me is I specified a table up here, and yet I'm receiving information about two different tables. So that suggests to me that possibly I set up this example incorrectly or commented it incorrectly. So let's just hold off on taking this one uh, so seriously. Number eighteen, selecting a table definition. I'll come back to it and uh, fix it up once I once I see a little bit better what's going on here. Here's an example of altering schema, adding a field to a table. Um, I'm sure this is really exciting to uh, some folks. I know this is something that Vince wanted me to talk about too. So um, we'll call out a couple things. Um, first thing you'll notice this is in red is because I'm using a different authorization header. This particular authorization header that's gonna be swapped in for this request has full access, which is required when you are doing schema modifications. Not surprisingly, right? You need full access to be able to do that sort of stuff. Um, you can notice how in the URL is targeting the system FileMaker tables table, which again, those of you who are used to the SQL world part of FileMaker, um, is something you've seen and used before. Um, so let's, before we run it, let's just make sure that I haven't run it recently and we don't already have this, uh, this field added. The actual request is that we're going to add, we're going to target the person table. You can see from the URL, we're going to add a container field um, named my image. Let's make sure we don't have one in there already. Okay, looks like I, I was ready for us and I, I took it out because I've run this one before, of course. So uh, let's see what happens. Um, I'm always a little bit nervous about these things because I'm not sure they're gonna work. Um, what we got back looks like a successful response. I'm not seeing any errors there and I can see my added field in the table definition. So let's go see if we actually got it. There it is. Container field added to your table or to your, yeah, to your table. And again, uh, since I've got this open, take another look at the relationship graph. I mean, it's just really super cool that we can do all this stuff without having to have any particular setup in any particular way on this file, other than having the functionality enabled in the first place. Um, I may come back to that a few times because it, it definitely is one of the features that really excites me. So there's an example of altering schema. I think the next one is actually creating a new table. Um, let's see what I've got here. It looks what I've, like what I've set up here is, I want to add a table called activity log to this solution. Um, now I'll, I'll mention a couple or a caveat about this particular feature, but you know, it's got a lot of potential in that, you know, what if you could, maybe maybe you've got some sort of activity log solution um, that you've pre-built and for whatever reason, you're not going down the add-on path, but you've got a solution where you can, you can add it in with just an OData command. Now, I don't think we're really quite there yet, but the potential for it is obviously there. I will say the potential for it. Um, and I think that's pretty exciting. So, here we've got basically a table definition. Um, it's a pretty humble one. I've got an ID field, a current user, current timestamp, and a log message field. Let's make sure I'm, we were just there. I don't think I have that table there. That is correct. So let's go ahead and run it. And, and again, we had to run this with full access. We're seeing the table definition and the response. And that tells me, because there's no error in that table definition, it's probably there. There's our new table. Um, we defined it to have an account name that's populated and a creation timestamp that's populated. Now, the caveat that I wanted to mention here is that I have not seen a way where we can have this automatically populate something like what we'd probably want to have in here, right? Um, if there's a way to do that, I haven't found it yet. Um, so we'll just have to wait and see. From, from what I can tell, it's not there. Um, and, uh, you know, setting something like a calculation field isn't there either. Setting an aggregate field isn't there. From what I can tell, it, it could be that we'll all learn about this a little bit more and we'll see there was a way to do this. Um, at present, I don't see such a way. Okay, next example, container data. Um, there are a couple ways that you can update uh, container data in a record. Uh, of course, you've got binary data that you're trying to send up to the, to the server. Um, one way is to have that binary content be actually included as the payload inside of here in a raw format. That is to say the actual bytes. 
Um, this particular example uses the other methodology, which is to send it as base 64 encoded value. So uh, we've got that new my image field that we just added a moment ago, and we've got some base 64 data that is an encoding of the beeswax logo. Um, it's a ping, I believe. And we're going to send it up there and we're going to target this particular record and uh, update it. And let's see who is that going to be? 8D. I have a feeling this is Ignacio again. Let's see. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we're targeting Ignacio's record. So let's let's get him on the screen in form view. And let's add our image field to the layout. All right, so we can see we're sitting on Ignacio's record here. We've got the container field there. Let's give it a go. We're back to using our regular credentials, by the way, because we're no longer altering schema. Our URL is targeting the specific record. We're using the patch. Patch is the, the HTTP verb you use when you're updating a record. We specified the field that we want to update. We're providing the data. I think we look good to go. Okay. You can see our image just got updated and uh, we're basically getting a success response back um, from the server. So there you have it. That's the ability to update container data. I'm going to go ahead and remove this from the layout again and put us back to table view. And um, let's keep going. Running a script. All right. Um, it's not a particularly, uh, well, I was going to say it's not a particularly surprising um, way to call it, but actually, I, I take that back. I, this, this did catch me a little bit off guard. The way that you run a target a particular script is you use script at the end of your URL dot the name of the script URL encoded. There are some restrictions about um, what kind of characters can be included. I'm, don't, I'm not remembering them offhand off the top of my head, so I'm not going to try to claim what they are. Um, but, you know, the veterans already know that you want to be careful when you name stuff in the first place. This is one more reason to uh, adhere to such a policy. Um, so I've got a script in here called delete end records. I won't bother showing it to you because um, it's what you'd expect. It's going to receive a parameter of n as a script parameter. In this case, I'm going to call it with 10, and it's going to delete that many records uh, from the bottom, I believe. So right now we've got a found set of 32, and uh, you can see we've got these records down at the bottom. Looks like we're going to get rid of a lot of Morris Mule and Odalia's octopus and so forth. Let's run it and see what happens. Okay, there they went. We're down to 22 records. Records were deleted. No real surprises. Um, you know, it's an example of executing a script. Uh, what I should call out though, um, I didn't have a chance to fill in the comments over here yet, but uh, important to know, your on first window open script trigger and on last window close script trigger, those are going to be triggered. That caught me by surprise, you know, because of the freedom from all the layout stuff, I was kind of expecting that triggers weren't going to fire off on this, um, but they do. So um, beware. And as I update this uh, sample file, I'll make sure to make a note of that in there. Let me take a look at uh, questions and then we'll get back to this next one. Updating multiple records matching criteria. While I read the questions, maybe you can kind of scout at the, you know, the comments. And the URL, because this is a, this is a pretty exciting feature that's here. Um, so, give me just a moment to take a look at the comments, see if there's any questions. Record locking. Great question from Stephen. Um, not surprisingly, since your name's Stephen, um, we will get into that. Uh, record locking is coming up in, in just a few more examples. Um, let's see. Locking conditions. Does OData give the ability to patch a relational FileMaker data structure, for, in, for example, order and line items, and treat it as a transaction when you succeed or fail atomically? Awesome question, Tony. Um, I better sort of hustle it up a little bit because I definitely want to get to this transactional stuff. So um, let's keep going. Uh, we're about just a couple records away from it, um, and we'll get to the transaction stuff, which is it's, it's the exciting stuff, um, although this is an exciting one too. Check out this filter that's being used here. The filter is last name equals digging turtle. Um, let's make sure we've got somebody in here with digging turtle, or at least change the query so that it works better. 
you know what? Not a whole lot in here with digging turtle, is there? Let's uh gonna have to do our best. Let's uh let's change. We got Arthur. We're gonna make Arthur be ant. We're gonna change some some data around here so we can have a better example. This will be Agnes Ant. I'm basically trying to get a set up some records where um, we can do a, a batch sort of update, and it won't really help if I don't have some some records that I can select as a batch. So that's that's why I'm doing this here. Ada, Ada Ant, and let's change Norbert, Alice, Alice Ant. All right, so I've just sort of. Fabricated, let's unsort these puppies. Um, I just sort of fabricated some data where we've got a lot of, or we've got a, a handful of records that match a particular last name. So let's let's change our query from digging turtle to ant. That's what we're going to target. We're basically setting up a filter that says match me all records that have a last name value of ant. Um, Hopefully you can kind of see your way through the percent encoding here to, to catch that. And what we're going to say is we want to update the last name on all these records to deer. Um, deer is not going to work. So uh, there is, there's a validation uh, requirement here that everybody's in alliteration. That was in case I wanted to demonstrate um, update failures. So let's not try deer. Let's uh, instead of ants, it'll be ant eater. All right. So again, the request is going to say match everybody that's got a last name of ant and update them based on this uh, payload down here. Let's see if I got it correct. Boom. Okay. We get an empty setback because nobody's, or presumably because nobody's matching ant anymore. If you take a look at the data, everybody that was ant is now ant eater. So this is kind of a first in these examples where we're not just targeting a single record. We're targeting a collection of records uh, that match a particular criteria and saying update all of those. We're not quite at the point where we're doing transactions, but uh, bear with me because we're going to get there. In fact, we're, we're there right now. Introduction to batches and change sets, creating records. All right. The topic of doing multiple updates at once or multiple creations at once um, as an atomic unit, which is to say, um, transactionally, or to say that, you know, if there's one failure amongst uh, the, the operations that happens, we want them all to fail. That's of a lot of interest, to all of us, right? And this was the reason, as I said earlier, this was the reason why I got into this technology. So, nomenclature there's something called a batch, and there's something called a change set. All right, and I've got them listed here. A batch is an ordered sequence of operations. And by operation, I mean something like an, an update, an insert, or a delete. Um, a change set is an unordered atomic set of operations. So when you want to do transactional work, you're going to be using a change set. If you just want a, a collection of operations to happen without that sort of all or none functionality, you can use a batch. Um, by default, if one of the operations fails in a batch, uh, the batch exits and it doesn't try any further operations in its batch. You can, however, set an edit, uh, a header that uh, gives the instruction to continue to attempt processing the rest of the batch. Um, change set, of course, is more interest is of more interest to me uh, because of the transactional nature. Let's see what I've got set up here. Um, okay, so this is an example of adding three records transactionally, or because I've said it's send as transaction transactionally. Now let me back up for just a minute and say that this demo file allows me to. Put my input as JSON because we can all read that much better than the actual format of the request. But let's take a look at the format of this request. Um, it's not pretty. I'm going to paste it into a text editor for a minute so we can have a look at it. Um, I said it's not pretty, but it is comprehensible. Um, you're basically looking at uh, a sequence of operations that have been delineated by boundaries boundary strings, and I don't want to go too much in the detail about it, but suffice it to say that if you spent three minutes to 15 minutes with this, you would see the pattern and you would see that there's a delineation of, 
of different operations in here, and that they're all enclosed with one giant within one giant operation. And that's the format that these have to be sent to the server. Because it's not a convenient uh, format to, or I shall say, because I don't have facility with this format, um, I wrote a script that basically takes my JSON and translates it into this format so that I can have these sorts of demos and we can move forward without having to wrap our eyes around what we were just looking at in BB Edit. So jumping back to this example here, the JSON is telling us we're gonna add three records, each to the person table. You can see each, each particular operation is specified individually. They don't have to be from the same table. We could specify different tables um, and that would work just as well. Now, looking at this, let's try this. We're gonna do this as a transaction and I mentioned earlier, I've got a validation in there that says uh, the, the person record has to have an alliteration with their first and last name. I believe I've got a validation that's enforced on the last name field that says the first letter has to match the first letter of the first name field. So this second entry right here is going to fail. Dariush Goat is not going to be allowed. And if this is gonna happen transactionally, when I run this, we don't expect to see any of these three records created. So let's take a look. We're starting with 22 records over here. We expect this to fail. We expect to still have 22 records once I've run this. So, and this gory thing is what the actual request looks like. So having said all that, let's run it and see what happens. Okay, here we go. You can see in the response output, field failed calculation result test. We're still at 22 records. So one field failed, or one, I should say one record uh, creation failed and none of them happened. We got our transaction. So kind of cool. Let's go back and uh, patch up our data and make sure that it happens this time. We'll change Darius to Darius dog. That's gonna be allowed. And uh, let's run it again, see what happens. Okay, you can see down here, we got our three records added. Um, I don't think I need to belabor it. Uh, that's your very most basic transaction sort of thing. Like I said, we could put in a different table in here in this specification, and it would add that other record to that other table. In fact, I'm tempted to try that just to illustrate it. Let's see how we're doing on time. We don't really have the time for me to dilly dally. So let's keep going a little bit, and then we can take suggestions for what to try. Uh, updating records. Okay, same kind of thing. In this case, we're going to be doing an update, and we want that update to be um, transactional. So let me see if these characters still exist. We've got 4C. I don't even know who these people are anymore. Deer, Mule, and Anteater. You know what? Let's let's just see what happens. We'll we'll get an error if they don't exist. Um, I'm going to change Mule to something that I know will fail. So I do that. X is going to fail for sure. Let's give it a go. Apologies for not having this one worked out. It's it's a matter of me changing this data so much to prepare this that I'm not totally ready for this. Okay, X failed. Let's let's see what happens if we put something back in here that's more sensible. Um, you know what? We're gonna have to get rid of it because I don't even remember what it was. Let's just do two and see what happens. Failed calculation result. All right, you know what? I can see that this is not going to go somewhere very easily unless we just recreate our data. So let's, we're going to target Evelio. Let's put Evelio's ID in here. We're going to update Evelio to Evelio Eel. And let's find Ignacio. Ignacio's I. So Ignacio's good. We're going to. I'm at a loss, so instead of an animal name, we're just going to say igloo. Here we go. Okay, we got success. You can see here uh, 200 and 200 result, co result codes for successful updates. We come back to our data. We see that Evelio changed to Evelio Eel, Ignacio to Ignacio Igloo. Now let's uh, demonstrate the failure case. Instead of igloo, igloo, let's change it to horse or attempt to do so. That's going to fail, of course, because horse is not going to work for Ignacio's record. And uh, we'll see that when this happens, um, Evelio's name is not going to change to elephant, even though I've asked it to. So let's go. Failure, that remains the same. 
Okay, so that's uh, that's basic, basic, basic transactional stuff. You can see the potential is there. Um, there's more stuff that we can do, and I want to try to cover that in a little bit, but I also want to um, see how we're doing with questions. All right, um, it's about licensing stuff largely. There's some other stuff. You know what, I'm going to plow forward, and hopefully that's going to work for the sort of maximum number of people in the audience. Um, because this is a, this is an interesting and, and, and kind of cool next topic to go into. Check out this query up here. Um, I've specified using the select uh, query option. Now, as a reminder, the select query option is the one that you use to specify what fields you want returned in the results set. Now, I've used a special uh, value here called row mod ID. That's going to return me the modification, the record modification count for that particular record. Now, this record that we're targeting is in the stats table. There's only one record in that table, and that's what we're targeting. Um, the idea was, you know, I was hoping to put together some presentation where I could show transactionally updating the total person count at the same time as I'm adding people. Um, didn't have time to create that and don't have time to present it now. Um, but you can get the idea. We're going to query this record to get the values from here. And uh, let's take a look at it. This is just a query, so it should be pretty easy. Okay, this record has a row, uh, a record modification count of three, and we got our total person count. So wrap your heads around this for just a minute. This is the thinking. Let's say we've got some transactional code that's going to add some records to this person table. And when we do so, we want to transactionally update the value in this one single stats record so that this total person count is up to date. And maybe we're going to update this uh, field called oldest person too. Maybe we're going to figure out that when we add some, you know, some data in here or edit some data in here or delete some records, whatever changes we make, we want to update these values to sort of show aggregates or sort of status values. And we want to have them stored. And because we're storing them and doing them this way and they're not calculated on the fly, um, we want to make sure that we do this transactionally so that our data stays in sync. That is to say, we aren't updating data in this table without uh, regard to the fact that we need to potentially update the value in this record. We want to do it transactionally, which is to say all or nothing. If we are unable to update this record, we want the edits or changes in here. Vice versa, if some change in here fails, we don't want to go updating this record. Now, we've already seen that we can do um, or we've seen the potential, at least I didn't demonstrate all of it, but we we have the idea that we can do these updates transactionally together. But the question is, how are we going to populate this value? Let's say we add three records here. We want to update this 31 to 34, and we want to do it transactionally. The way that I'm proposing, and take this with a grain of salt, because you know I've only had li literally just hours experience with this with this technology. I'm not sure if this is the best way to do it, but it's it's definitely an avenue where I see potential. My suggestion is that we first query this record, get the value that we intend to update. In this case, it'll be 30. We're going to fictitiously add three records here. So we're going to update this to 34, but we get the row mod ID um, value from this, and we can use that as a criteria to cause a failure. If this record has been updated since our last, uh, you know, since, since we got this value, then we know that we want our update to fail. And that's what's going to happen in this next example here. So I've got something called update record with modification count check. Um, it's really just an elaboration of what we've been doing earlier on. We're targeting a particular table stats. We're targeting a particular record with its ID. And we're saying, I want you to update the total person count. Let's say we're going to update it to 35. No, I said 34. We're going to update it to 34. And we know the modification count is three. So we're going to specify that and say, last time I checked, modification count was at three. So go ahead and succeed if this works and fail if, it, if that's been changed. So let's send it. It should work because uh, we just got three a minute ago and nobody else is touching our data right now. It succeeded. Okay. We were able to update this value to 34 and um, it worked as expected. Let's run it again. Now, this time we know that the modification count is no longer at three. So what I'm expecting is that this is going to fail and we'll get into the details of the why of that in just a moment. And I realize we have pretty much just a moment left. Let's send it. 
field failed calculation result test. Let's check out why. In the definition for stat, this field called modification check, validate by calculation. Let's look at the validation. Uh, the value of this field has to equal record modification count. That is how I am triggering the error if we get the wrong modification count. Uh, going back to what we're doing here, if I specify the correct modification count, which in this case right now should be at four, I can set this to whatever I want and have it go through. You can see the changes reflected there. If I set it to something else, it's going to fail as we just saw a moment ago. So we don't really have a whole lot of time to like wrap into like uh, or to talk about exactly how all the pieces fit together. But I already know there's, you know, a multitude of bright minds out there. I read the audience list. Um, I think probably a lot of people are already seeing where I'm heading with this. The idea being that we can grab uh, data and a check that allows us to know if it's safe to update this record. And then as we're making changes elsewhere, we can make one giant transactional operation and have a check that ensures that this data hasn't been touched or updated by somebody else during the time that we were doing our calculations during that brief amount of time between when we were getting our data, calculating it, and sending in our request to update it. And with that, um, well, let's just do one more just for the hell of it, because we're, we're already nearly out of time. Um, Eric or Steve, you know, pipe in if it's time for me to shut up. Um, let's see here. Did you have a chance to try out the aggregation functions average? Oh, from Simon. Alrighty. Um, Simon, I did have a little bit of a chance to do some stuff. Um, I think what we should probably leave it for another day though. Um, cause I don't have anything super conclusive or exciting. Let me show this one. This is this is kind of like a circus trick, if you will. Um, we've got something we looked at before where we're sending in a request. Last name is Deer. Again, I don't know if we've got a last name Deer. What did we change everybody to? Anteater. Let's do that. Last name Anteater. We're going to find all those people. And we're going to change their name to something else. And... You know what? This is just going to succeed the way I do it. So it's it's not uh, it's not all that exciting to be quite honest. Um, I don't think I can cook up an example. Let me just tell you what the example is supposed to do. We'll we'll let it succeed. We'll change everybody to ant. Um, we've done this once before already. I'm expecting to see anteater change to ant in all these cases. We're basically saying where last name is anteater. Go ahead and do this update. Change last name to ant. Let's do it. Worked. Um, finally got the update there. The point of this, uh, example, and I apologize that I don't have it cooked up well enough to demonstrate it is that this is being done transactionally. And if there had been some reason why one of these would have failed, oh, I take it back. Let's, we can do it. Check it out. We're going to do this again. We're going to change back to anteater. I just realized how I plan to do this. We're going to lock a record. Let's lock. All right, so I'm in Ada's record. I'm modifying it. That record is locked. We're going to run the same kind of uh, same kind of command that we did a minute ago, and this time it's going to fail. This is transactional. Nobody here is going to change. So let's let's give it a go. Affected row zero. I'm expecting to yeah. see an error message somewhere. The, the filter value needs to be updated. Oh, gracias. Thank you. That's Robert, huh? Robert, I appreciate always your attention to this, this kind of detail. Um, so we're looking for ants, right? Perfect. I appreciate you chiming in there. Um, okay, Ada's record is still locked. Otherwise, this should work. And uh, let's give it a go. Okay, we got the record locked message down here. Nobody changed. All right, as soon as I let go of Ada's record, get out of there and again you know just take a quick look everybody's still at ant now we'll be able to send this one through and everybody should change there they go so uh to summarize we were able to match a found set with some matching criteria and transactionally all or none edit those records and in the case where one of those failed we demonstrated that it it didn't happen you know it was transactional as we wanted um 
I can see we're out of time. We did make it through most of uh, what I had here. You can see I've got like a, a few examples that I'm going to try to include in here that show some of the gotchas. Um, and I think I'll probably have some more to, you know, it's kind of okay that that we didn't have time for them because these are some of the ones where I could really stand to flesh them out a little bit better. Um, I thank everybody for their attention and uh, I'm going to take a quick look at the questions, but I, I think we're out of time here. Uh, can you use the OData query that you showed early to add base tables and fields to a file where users are connected to it? Is this safe? Um, Tony, that's an excellent question, and I don't know the answer to it. So um, uh, I will put it on my list to try to figure out. And I see a demo file available. I'll say this um, we definitely want to make it available. Usually the procedure is that this will be reviewed by my peers, probably made a little bit prettier than what I can do with it. Um, you know, we'll try to weed out the bugs, and then I'm pretty sure somebody's going to say, Steve, you got to write a blog post with this. And at that point, the file will be available. Um, I don't know when that's going to be, but uh, we're not going to dilly dally. This is something that, that I'd love to see get out there. And, um, you know, Jay could probably speak better to the, to the timeline for it. And uh, there we have it. Um, thank you folks. Uh, I was kind of nervous because I don't present much. I probably spoke a little fast. I appreciate you all, um, you know, putting up with that and, uh, and also just taking the time to, to see some of this stuff. I'm really excited about it. I'm sure that shows. Um, I hope this stimulates some, some interest in it. So, uh, good night. Well, thanks, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thanks, there. Yes, technically we weren't out of time. So if you did. You oh, something. cool. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, this this is close to the time that most people start winding down. It's questions and answers, and uh, anybody wants to desperately wants to see the next thing that you was going to present, um, say so. <laughs> it's your last chance. Yeah, no, I'm definitely here for questions if there are. Um, you know, I, I'm not familiar with the format of these meetings, so I don't want to drag them out longer than uh, they need be. But uh, but I'm here. What was the next thing you were going to show? Let's see. Uh, we jump back a couple of things. All right. Uh, let's say you've got a summary field in a table, and you do a, a select to grab some rows from that table. The question that I had that I wanted to answer is that summary field going to reflect the found set or is it going to ref um, and sorry further you're using uh, top and offset to to reduce your found set to limit it. Is it going to re represent the values the or the count that would be in the entire found set without the limitations or does it reflect the limitations uh, applied by top and skip and the answer that I seem to be seeing is that top and skip affect. Uh, aggregate value. So don't think of it as like, I've got this found set. I'm only returning one record because I just need to get the grab the summary value from that one record. You're only going to get a summary value for that one record if you do that. Um, so just something to note there. Uh, I had an example of setting date and number values because that's always, you know, a question when you're doing these kinds of things. How do I get the date format right? Um, you know, what number formatting? Uh, I had an example of uh, not getting a, or getting a type mismatch error when setting a number value and something that concerns me a little bit having to do with precision in JSON values for numbers. If you've got something that's, you know, like, I think I've, I've got something point zero 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 one. Um, hmm. I haven't had enough time to work with this, but from a cursory glance, it looks like we are subject to lo losing precision in these sorts of cases. I have to play with it more to, before I can really say that with conviction though. Um, this last one is pretty theoretical and, um, probably best saved for another day. It relates to an alternative approach to some of the transactional stuff that we were looking at a little while ago. It looks, like, looks like that makes the, uh, sample file all the more interesting now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, just, there's, uh, you know, there's, uh, this 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 one particular record we could do without it. Um, I was basically pursuing an avenue of thought that that didn't turn out. Um, I put the example in here because I figure, you know, like I said, there's a lot of great minds in the audience. They're going to be thinking about these things, um, and I wanted to sort of share what I had found so far. Um, and so that included even you know items like number thirty three, which were sort of uh, investigative. Uh, 
uh, pursuits. Okay. Well, thanks. All righty. Um, we got a few few responses uh, down there too. It looks like. Yeah, for precision data pipe returns full. Yeah, exactly. Who's that, Sean? Um, same deal, man. Uh, it's it's uh. Well, it, maybe it's not exactly the same deal, but bottom line is, I think it's I think it's the result of the same same kind of thing going on. I don't think it's necessarily an issue with O data, but probably some of the transport mechanisms that go in between um, this actually hitting the the real O data system and in between the fact that we're using JSON. I suspect that's where the the precision loss is coming in, not not for a fault of the O data engine itself. Um, I can't. You know, I can't assert that because I'm not an engineer on the team, but I, I think that's a pretty reasonable speculation. I'll say. I don't know. Did you see the question about uh, what about the rest of uh, FileMaker Server Mac and Windows? When when do you think uh, that? Yeah, I have. Uh, oh yeah, another question. Yeah, great. I mean, we're gonna have to punt that to somebody who's more in the know. Um, I'm I'm definitely hoping for the other platforms. Although I must say I'm really excited about Linux already, um, but uh, I don't know the answer to that. Definitely think it's a question that that's worth asking and getting an answer to. And as I already mentioned, my my wish list is that someday we get a function that's called uh, execute O data API script step because um, I think that would circumvent some of the issues that I have revolving storage of credentials and. Um, would afford us all this ability to do transactional stuff with minimum modification to our, you know, to our uh, relationship graph and, and layouts and so forth. So it'd be, in my eyes, it would be a huge, um, a huge opportunity for us. Well, query, the, yeah, of course, could the query you did over get could also take place without relying on get. Um, so Robert, the I think I'm not sure I answered I, I understand the question well enough, but I suspect that the answer is probably going to be no, because it is very specific um verb to use. So if the question is like, can we do it with a post? Um, the answer is probably no. And but you know, the devil's in the details. It depends on the query that we're talking about. Um, there might be another way to concoct the same result with a slightly different query. Okay. Thank you, Robert. Um, really, really nice to have you here, by the way. And again, appreciate you chiming in. Um, okay, well, um, folks know where to find me. Um, I'm at Beeswax. I'm also, I spend a lot of time on the forums. So, um, you know, feel free to hit me up with questions if you need some follow up or would like some follow up. And, uh, I'm sure there will be an, ish, an initiative at Beeswax to get this material available to everybody um, in some way that you can have your hands on it. Um, for most of it, for you know, for the veterans in the audience, you don't really need this file other than it might save you some some grief when when I tried to tease out some of the you know some of the gotchas and um, you know writing writing the concocting this sort of format for the batch processing. Um, that was the that was the only part where I stumbled a lot in order to get this to happen. So um, I definitely would like to share that with people so that you don't have to stumble in the areas that I that I did. Um, I'll leave it at that. Let me use custom functions, pass those details to local variables, and insert those into a call, perhaps. Yeah, Jason, I'm just reading your your comment about custom functions and so forth. I, I'm kind of a custom function geek myself. Um, so, you know. Without knowing exactly what you're getting at, uh, it's definitely something that I would give a thumbs up to pursuing. I know not everybody is as enthusiastic about custom functions as I am, so um, you know a lot of ways to to go about this stuff. Um, you know, I think the base the basics are here. How we wind up uh, comprising this content that we send to the server, um, I think we've got a lot of ways we can do it, and definitely custom functions is something that that I would consider if I were working kind of like lone wolf, um, since I'm more in a pool of developers, I'm interested in finding stuff that, that appeals to all of us. Oh, that does, that makes sense. I, I know that the big concern was, uh, keeping credentials in the clear. Ah, uh, um, I see. 
because that's a huge thing. So if you were to store your credentials, uh, a username and a password, say, in a custom function, and then when you go to execute a script, you set the variable to that custom function. So the username becomes a local variable. The password mm -hmm. becomes a local variable from a custom function. And then you pass those, the, uh, the variables in your URL call, as opposed to the username being in the clear and the password being in the clear. Now it's sort of masked and only people that have, you know, full access to be able to edit custom functions would be able to go in and modify view or, or make those changes. Whereas the rest of your users, it's totally transparent to them because, you know, a custom function can just run. And if they're not wiser of it, then they can't go and get information from it. Yeah. So That's Jason, uh, uh, yeah, no, I, I got you exactly. And Simon just mentioned what I was going to, I was going to up the ante on you one. Simon in the comments said, don't forget about the DDR though. Those credentials will appear in the DDR. Um, my own line of thinking for this, and and I will reiterate what I said earlier, I am no kind of security expert. So uh, I'm just tossing ideas around as somebody who sort of thinks open-mindedly. Um, my thought was to encrypt the credentials and store either the encrypted value in a custom function and the key as data in a record or vice versa. And that way, if you export a, data, a DDR, you don't see the data in the in the that's stored in the table. You just see an encrypted value. And so it's not available plain text, um, but you still have at runtime, you have the wherewithal to do a decryption. You can access that one particular record that's got your keys stored in it. Presumably it's locked down as tightly as possible with permissions. And then you can decrypt based on what's stored in the custom function. So I'm, I was kind of thinking along similar lines, but I was trying to go one further because I, I did want to protect uh, the possibility of, of uh, this sort of information being output in the DDR. Uh, you are most certainly correct, but, you know, it's just kind of throwing some stuff out there that, you know, get oh, some people. Absolutely. No, absolutely. And, and, and I appreciate it. And, and I'll be the first to say that I'm not convinced that what I just suggested is the way to do it. It's um, I think at this point, we're all just kind of tossing out ideas of, of, you know, what occurs to us, what we might do. Um, honestly, when, when somebody comes out that I trust, who's like a security authority and they, they lay down the law, that's where I'm going to listen the most. But but at this point, you know, um, I think it's I think we've got to think about these things and and figure out you know what we can, and um, I appreciate you mentioning that. It's it's a, totally a concern for me. Uh, absolutely not a problem. Cool. There was a, there was a pause in error that was focused on security. We're still being recorded, right? Yes. Um, so all I'll say for now is that uh, you know storing in schema versus storing in data is an interesting question. Um, there are a rather broad portfolio of FileMaker features that pertain to security. Scripts can be run with full access. Uh, the account name seems to be something that you can hide behind rather reliably. As to whether you could construct a system to store things securely using a combination of those things, I don't know. Yeah. We're still being well recorded. From from reading the comments, I can tell we've got everybody's everybody's bringing up the exact points that I've been wondering about myself. So it's it's kind of nice to no longer have to wonder about them alone and and see what see what the community is having to say here. I mean, if you have data in a field and the field is completely locked down, but if it's accessible through a script run with full access, yeah, and that script can only be run by a particular account. Yeah, the, the point about the DDRs was good too, because you know we actually would leave our DDRs open to you know, our power users so that they could they could understand what was going on behind the scenes, in, in a lot of cases. Um, you know, it's kind of like what PeopleSoft does with their their people tools. You know, they they actually expose a lot of that in their documentation. Um, but you know, of course, um, the, you'd have to be you, you the DDR would mean that you'd have to be vigilant. As to, you know, not just who runs the DDR, but how you store it. Yeah, and we uh, we actually we explicitly leave certain things out because I think what was it, what was one of the things? Oh, external uh, external sources expose yeah. passwords as well, and yeah. so we we leave those out of our DDRs now. Uh, Interesting. Yeah, I, I think the 
the overall thinking is uh, people want credentials to be only available to who needs them. And how you go and implement something that enforces that is is where uh, it, it can be uh, uh, difficult at times. Yeah, well, ag agreed. And, um, you know, I, I won't repeat myself, but it's that's definitely it's it's a puzzle that I like thinking about, but I don't feel qualified to. Uh, state that I've got a solution 25 years ago when I was a lot younger and thought I knew a lot more than I did. I probably would have, you know, just said that I had a solution that would work, but, but, uh, with time comes some humility, I guess. There, there was a big debate kind of a, about this topic. And it was a public debate, so I don't mind repeating some of the things that were brought up during that debate because it was all previously published, so to speak. And one of the security concerns, you know, there was, a, you know, different, different opinions. One of the security concerns was that a script can be halted, which uh, I took to mean that any persistent storage of credential information that was stored somewhere in a field uh, during a script that was run could be exposed by halting the script. And my my take on it would be that um, halting a script, I would expect, would also halt certain uh, credential storage that is in memory in variables, for instance. So any uh, system that stores, you know, temporarily stores credentials in fields in a script is seems to be vulnerable to hacking based on a halting of a script. But temporarily storing things in variables uh, would be safer. Would it be absolutely safe? That would be up for further debate. That's where they left off. This was about a year and a half ago. It was a lively debate. Yeah, no, I, I think I, I think I've probably seen that that very one. Um, folks, I think I'm going to sign off. I, I don't think there's um, anything that requires me to be here. It's been a super big honor and pleasure to be amongst the people that that uh i've seen for years on the forums um and you know attended some of your presentations so um yeah what a pleasure and uh we'll see you soon well done well done yeah, thank you all right bye 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 thanks steve bye bye everyone uh, thank you steve thanks for throwing the party so long <laughs> all right i'm stopping the recording thanks steve thanks eric thank you Thank you.